Hello and welcome to season 10 of the Meaning Movement Podcast. If you're watching this, if you're hearing my voice, this is the culmination of a ton of work that my team and I have been doing over the past few months to get ready, to get prepared to 4X our production with this podcast. You may have heard me talk about before how important the Meaning Movement is to me personally and how much I've wanted to see it to go to new places and how I'm kind of just throwing everything at the wall, see what sticks, kind of blowing it up to see what's going to happen. And this episode and this season of the next couple of months of doing two episodes per week is a piece of that process for me. So I'm so excited to be here with you to be doing this together. So welcome to season 10. Hey everybody, before we begin, I just want to invite you to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening and also enable automatic downloads at any time you're on the go and want something to listen to, you'll have our latest episodes ready for you on whatever device you're listening. So hit that subscribe button. If you have the option to leave a rating and review wherever you're listening, please do that as well on Amazon and on Apple in particular are incredibly, incredibly helpful. Our guest today is John Ostensen. He's one of the foremost franchise consultants in the United States. He's also an owner and investor. He's an author and international speaker, all specializing in the area of non-food franchising. He's the founder and CEO of Fran Bridge Consulting, where he educates clients about non-food franchises and helps them start businesses that fit their goals. He's a vast experience in the industry, drawing on his expertise from his previous professional roles as both the president of an Inc. 500 franchise system, as well as a multi-brand franchise owner. We dig into all of that in the interview. It's really fun to hear his story. He's also the author of Non-Food Franchising and the Franchise Path. He's a frequent contributor on franchising for publications such as Forbes and the Franchise Journal. I've been saying that word franchise so many times in this intro. It doesn't even mean anything. It's starting to sound weird, but it's true. If there's one word you associate with John, it's that. I had a blast talking with him about franchises. I had a lot of misconceptions about what a franchise is and what ownership can be like. This conversation selfishly was just a great way for me to indulge my curiosity and learn a lot about a possible alternative path to business ownership and, and to entrepreneurship that I had never previously considered. I had a ton of fun in this interview and I think you will enjoy it as much as I do. This of course is the Meaning Movement Podcast, a show about work worth doing. I'm your host, Dan Cumberland, today with guest John Ostensen. Stay with us. This episode, like all episodes of the Meaning Movement podcast, is made possible by The Calling Course. I just want to say, what, what do I mean by that when I say made possible? It sounds like something that they say in Sesame Street at the beginning or the end. My kids love Sesame Street. What I mean by that is this is a bootstrapped project. I have a course called The Calling Course. It's what I consider the cornerstone or, or flagship offering of the meaning movement. That course is all about work, all about purpose, all about navigating this space of these questions of who am I? What is my life about? Where am I going? What's my contribution going to be? Whether that's right now, in the future, whatever it might be. This podcast has expenses. We pay for those expenses via sales of that calling course, also through sponsorship. Share a little bit more about in just a moment. But I wanted to just, instead of talking about the calling course here today, wanted to share some words from a recent member of the course. This is Ryan. He sent this over and gave me permission to share this with you. So I'm going to read from him his thoughts on being a part of the calling course. He says, discovering more of who I am and how that connects to the world in work is an overwhelming process. It can be hard to know where to start and easy to feel stuck. The meaning movement has been a great acceleration, affirmation, and help in this to me. The Calling Course specifically offered new perspectives and a deeper invitation into who I am and how I can walk the path to becoming my fullest self, connected to others in a mission through work. I love that so much. The combination of material, questions, and direct coaching through Q&A is powerful. I recommend it to anyone doing the hard work of walking deeper into their call. First, thank you so much, Ryan, for those words. They are just so 
fantastic, and I couldn't have said it better myself, which is why I'm reading them here. If you're listening or watching and you want to know more about the Colin course, the course I open up for enrollment periodically. I don't have a set schedule at this time, but the best way to know when it's going to be the next enrollment period is going to be opening is for you to be on the email list. You can get on the email list anywhere at themeaningmovement.com. You'll find a bunch of subscribe boxes around the site or go to the calling course, thecallingcourse.com. There is a free mini course. It gives just a small taste of what the calling course is all about. If you join that mini course, you'll be sure to be on the list for our next enrollment so if any of that sounds exciting and enticing to you, make sure to jump on the email list and then you'll be notified when that next enrollment period opens. I just want to take a quick moment to talk about sponsorship. I've always said that this podcast, this endeavor is made possible by The Calling Course. What that means is it's self-funded, it's bootstrapped, but we are opening the door to sponsors to come alongside us if they're a good fit for our audience. So if you have a business, a service, or work for someone who does that would like to get in front of an audience like ours, shoot us an email at podcast at the meaning We can tell you more about what we have to offer by way of our audience and sponsorship uh, opportunities. And we can take the conversation from there. Podcast at the meaning Thanks so much. John, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the meaning movement podcast. So great to have you here. Thanks, Dan. No, appreciate you having me on. I love the show and uh, look forward to a great conversation. The question I like to begin with is, how do you begin to talk about the work that you do? Yeah, really, at the end of the day, I help people get into business ownership. I love that. So crisp, so concise. <laughs> I guess you know, the follow-up question is, how did you get into business ownership? And then, of course, into helping others get into business ownership. You know, it's like meta, right? You're kind of zooming out another layer there. So let's start, you know, hear some of that story. Yeah, you know, Dan, like so many of your listeners, you know, I've always thought about business ownership and wanted to be an entrepreneur and, you know, never knew exactly what that looked like. And so I had a really good run in the corporate world and, you know, did the whole climb the ladder thing, you had some neat opportunities along the way. But about six years ago, I stepped away from public company life, which was a big decision, you know, golden handcuffs, all of that, but made a big step over to the private company world. So I kind of sidestepped into what I'm doing today and had the opportunity to serve as president of Shelf Genie Franchise System. It's an Inc. 500 company. We had some great growth and had the opportunity to really support our franchise owners across North America from a day in, day out ops standpoint. And that really opened up my eyes to this world that I now have dubbed non-food franchising. So long story short, ended up partnering with a few others and we've invested in franchises ourselves as the franchisee side. So I've been on both sides of the table. And now, you know, for the most part, we've got good people running those for us. It only takes up about 10% of my time and you know, creates passive revenue streams and allows me to spend 90% of my time helping others do the same. So we work with about 500 franchise brands across a wide array of industries. And I call it non-food franchising because we work in all these industries outside of food. And oftentimes people don't have those on their radar until we introduce them to them. And yet that's where most people are interested. So I have the opportunity to take people through a very streamlined process and play matchmaker, introducing them to the best opportunities that fit their set up and what we see resonating with others around the country. I love it. Very cool. So it sounds like you know, you're in the corporate world, climb that corporate ladder, and then it feels like maybe a bit of a lateral move into Shelf Genie. So you're still you know, very much at a big company there, but then allowed you to kind of get that exposure to the other side of business, I guess you could say. Is that a good yeah, interpretation of your journey? Absolutely. And of course, when you're in the thick of things, you know, everything's relative. And so, you know, for me, I was with a multi-billion dollar business and, you know, it wasn't at the very top, but it had, sure. had risen through the ranks and it you know, could have stayed there forever. You know, I liked it. I liked the team around us, but ultimately I had that entrepreneurial itch that I think so many yeah. people have and chose to scratch it. Though, again, I didn't jump full on into business ownership. I kind of stumbled my way into it through a really neat opportunity to help lead other business owners on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah. So even that, I guess, from your perspective was a step to a smaller company. From my perspective, like, that's a big company. And then that's another big company <laughs> as a small business owner. Like, they're all big. But I see what you're saying. You're, we're talking about you know, billions to a few less than that. So that makes a lot of sense. I have so many questions. So I'm an entrepreneur myself, of course, this podcast and the meaning movement. And I also have some software companies and have a little bit of real estate. I hear a lot of people talk about local businesses, buying businesses. I've been, you know, bootstrapping all of my businesses. And I've always been really curious about the franchise world because it seems from the outside, like either 
a great way to solve many of the problems that I have going from zero to, you know, having that initial momentum, like that the initial momentum problem, it seems like could be solved through a franchise model. But then two, it feels like really risky to put up a lot of money and effort into something that someone owns a part of. And yeah, so I want to just put that on the table saying where I'm entering into this conversation. And I'm curious how both of those ideas land with you as someone who's very versed in this world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of thoughts around that. First, I'd say, you know, nothing's ever entirely de-risked. However, with franchising, you look at the success rates of over 90% versus probably 10% for non-franchise. So, you know, part of that is because you have a lot more information going in. You have what's called the item 19 of the FDD, the franchise disclosure document. Every franchise system has one. So you get eyes wide open view of how all the other owners are performing within the franchise system. In addition, you get to do what we call validation. You get to talk to other owners before you make your purchase decision. So you do have a lot of data sets coming in. And and I'd say franchising really does de-risk the equation. I mean, ultimately, it still comes down to executing, but you're given a playbook that's been proven out. You're not questioning product market fit. You know the path to profitability on day one. It's time to go execute against it. You know, you've got a coach on the sidelines in that franchisor, and the better you do, the better they do. So they're supporting you. You've got other owners in other markets that you know are going through the same things you are, that are testing different marketing vehicles, or figuring out the best places to find great talent. And so you're exchanging best practices, learning from each other. And so you're not to be too cliche, you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And so it really does fit people well. And oftentimes it goes overlooked, but you're building an asset that you're going to be able to have an exit with down the road, as long as you build it halfway decent. And yeah. there was a study done recently by the Rinker School of Business that looked at 2000 business transactions that took place over a 10 year period. And they found that, you know, when comparing franchise versus non-franchise in like kind industries, the franchise businesses traded at a multiple of one and a half times the non-franchise. So there's oh, value from a resale standpoint down the road too. And you know, all that being said, you know, franchising is not right for everyone. Some people are too entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, I'm a member yeah. of the entrepreneurs organization. And sometimes you know, I have clients come from there that you know, I have to tell them, you want to put your thumbprints all over it, everything. You would not do well staying within the lines. Yes. However, in turn, I also have a lot of business owner clients that say, hey, I've been there, done that. I don't want to mm. recreate the wheel. I'd much rather step yeah. into something and execute on a given business. So a uh, totally. couple of quick thoughts around that. All of that just resonates so much with me. Before stepping into, I guess, the entrepreneurial world myself, how much I struggled with just being told what to do. I'm a pretty gracious and kind person externally, but internally, like sometimes I just like, I just really don't want to be told what to do. And so I could hear how, you know, I would imagine some people, they just wouldn't want to play by the playbook, if you will. And if you're not playing by the playbook, you're not going to be successful, I imagine. It really so. is true. And, you know, when I was a franchisor at Shelf Genie, on that side of the table, I had the opportunity to work with hundreds of owners across North America. And I really could see what separated the best from the average. And, you know, it was those that, you know, followed the system. And that sounds, yep. again, sounds cliche, yep. but it was so true that those that followed the playbook book where they are top performing. And you know, oftentimes, you know, when they first enter the franchise system, they would say, wait a minute, you guys are running the marketing for us. You're answering the phones with your call center. You're supporting us with product development and technology and you know, coaching us. What are we supposed to do day in, day out? And my answer was always, it comes down to the people in, in the local market, you know, be able to hire and retain top talent, make tough calls when needed, and then getting involved at the grassroots level, whether it be getting involved in the Chamber of Commerce or sponsoring the Little League baseball team. You know, one yeah. of our businesses, we just painted up a NASCAR recently for a big race. You know, I'm not a NASCAR cool. guy, but... I had so much fun taking my 10 year old son down to the pit, you know, and so you get to Love do it. things like that. We're getting ready to donate. We've got a driveway recoding business and, you know, fix cracks and everything. We're getting ready to do some nonprofit work in the local yeah. community, really be able to give back and turn yeah. it builds great marketing too. But, you know, so business ownership opens up those opportunities to do some fun things along the way. Yeah. And so even when you're playing by the playbook, there's still plenty of opportunity for creativity in how you engage with your marketing plan and advertising. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And every franchise system is different. But, you know, that's one of the things we talk about with our clients is let's find franchises that give you that leeway. I mean, the franchise or in the case of the driveway company, we actually, they co-sponsor the car with us, you know, and yeah. they didn't even blink when we asked them. So you know, it's all, it comes down to people having good people yeah. in the leadership and partnering with them. 
I love it. You mentioned earlier just the golden handcuffs. I have so many questions about franchise. I want to keep going there, but I want to just talk about that piece of like, how do you define golden handcuffs? I know that's a business term that I'm familiar with. I know not all listeners are familiar with, and you don't need to disclose details about that, but just conceptually, what is that when you refer to it? And then I think from there, I'd love to just get into like that decision of how do you leave something like that? And just the emotional, yeah, the emotions that go into it. I feel like a lot of anxiety and fear could, you know, be on the other side of that. So I want to kind of just focus in on that piece of your transition, because I know a lot of people listening might be in similar situations, whether or not they use that term, where they're thinking about a big change and really afraid of giving up what they've built up until that point. Maybe they have degrees, maybe they have legacies, maybe they have tenure, you know, those kinds of things. So maybe start like when, when you use that word golden handcuff, what did you mean by that conceptually? Yeah, it, you know, I got out of grad school back in 2005. I got my MBA and went with Carter's Oshkosh Bagash, big clothing company for children. Never thought I'd be in that yeah. industry, but had some really yeah. neat roles within it, working for the president. And, you know, over time, the company was very good to me in allowing me to take on additional responsibility and build out teams and additional clients. And, you know, 10 years in, that's when I made the jump. But I started thinking about it years in advance of that. But the tough thing wasn't what I referred to as the golden handcuffs. It was, you know, I had stock options, the best on a four-year basis every year, mm -hmm. you know, I had more lined up that I could potentially yeah. earn. And so at some point you have to cut the cord if you're going to walk away, you know, but just all the benefits that were provided and bonuses. And I mean, technically I had a corner office, even though I wasn't the CEO, but I had a corner office overlooking Buckhead and in five minutes from my home, very comfortable and I could have stayed. But once I made that decision to leave, I never looked back never yeah. once looked back in the past six yeah. years and would do it again in a heartbeat. And mm. at this stage, I really can't see myself ever working for someone again. I absolutely yeah. love being an entrepreneur. It's not right for everybody, but yes. what I found, Dan, time and time again, is so many good people have that desire internally mm. and they question, do I have what it takes? You know, where do I start though? You know, I want to be a business yeah. owner. I have friends that are business owners. Some have done great. Some haven't done so great, but I think I got what it takes, but where yeah. do I start? And that's where I just mm. love meeting them at that intersection and helping them yeah. uh, through the next couple yeah. of steps. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense that like, that was a really big decision, a pivotal moment in your life. And it makes sense that that would be a really, I imagine fulfilling place for you to be spending your time helping people who are in similar situations make that leap. Is that how you think about it? It is. I mean, day in, day out, I get to have conversations with great people all across the country. And, you know, we've done it long enough that we've been able to see the success stories. I mean, almost every one of our clients has come back and bought additional locations after launch. Mm -hmm. I mean, just great validation. Mm -hmm. I've only had one client where it didn't work out and they live three hours outside their market. And, and there's a whole set of, of circumstances kind of led to that. But every one of my other clients has thrived and it's been yeah. so much fun to see and a lot of times life changing for them. I love that. Yeah. How do you think about just imagining people who are you know, in that job, you know, I'm in Seattle where I know there's a lot of high earners who are, you know, working at the big tech companies here, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Adobe, et cetera, but they dream about, you know, the kind of thing that you're talking about. So I think that in a lot of ways they're at a similar place to where you were, but it's from the outside, it's easy to say that it's too risky and the safest thing to do is to just stay the course, do your work, which I have some thoughts about that, but I want to hear your thoughts just about that risk level. And is it as risky as it feels, I guess one, and two is staying as safe as we might tell ourselves. Yeah. I mean, ultimately the numbers don't lie and the data would show that over 92% of franchises are still in business five years later. So there's some data for you it versus, you know, a startup. I mean, we all know the success rate of those is, is significantly lower, but I think you hit on a great point. Sometimes working for others is less safe. And I think my clients come around to that idea, wait a minute, I'm working for someone else at their whim, being told what to do, mm. you know, and so for my situation, we'd built up where when I made the plunge and took the step and never looked back, you know, we weren't living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, we had some savings and we're able to, so I do encourage people, you know, make sure that you've got some savings. I mean, you don't want to risk everything, but you know, yeah. our average investment is between 125 and 300. That's where 75% of our deals fall. And for a lot yeah. of people, you know, whether they choose to fund it out of pocket or they choose to finance it through an SBA loan, I mean, there are a lot of mechanisms, even to self-direct your IRA and 401k, we have a program that can tap into that. So for some of those that have been with the company for a while, and Dan, I'd also point out that half of our clients are looking to make the full-time jump. Half are looking to stay in their current jobs. And they think of this as like a side hustle. Quite a yeah. few franchise systems cool. lend themselves to that semi-absentee or executive model. Now, that being said, nothing's easy. 
It still yeah. takes some work, but yeah. I mean, this is what we do, my partners and I, and then I've got plenty of client case studies to show where you can put a general manager in place from day one and let them run the day-to-day -day operations. And as long as you find a good person, which is a big if, and then yeah. you align your incentives correctly and set them up for success, you can build out a portfolio of investments in business ownership that help diversify from your stock portfolio, from your real estate holdings, from everything else. And they really play well together. I love that. Oh, I'm super curious about that. But before we get further into that, I'm curious about just the concept of non-food franchises. I think it'd be helpful for us, for listeners to know a little bit more of what types of businesses we're talking about. Because typically we think of probably food franchises. I think that's why you define it that way. We think of, you know, McDonald's and, you know, Chick-fil-A or Subway, you know, whatever it might be. I don't know if there's categories or how you want to answer that question, but like, what should people be thinking about when you say non-food franchises? What kinds of businesses are these? Absolutely. So for perspective, there are about 4,000 franchise brands in the U.S. Roughly half of those are in non-food categories. And what I found is over 95% of my clients want nothing to do with food. Now, 5% love food. 95% yes. would agree with me that there are easier ways to make money that might yeah. require smaller teams or a little less mm. capital intensive at the beginning, possibly, you know, just don't require inventory. Some of those things that, you know, you don't want to deal with. And the types of industries that we see people gravitating towards home and property services is a great example. $600 billion market. Nothing's been hotter since COVID. I mean, lots of interest there in all these different niches within that. Automotive. We've got some great concepts in automotive that just are very much semi-absentee. Health and wellness and fitness. Anything related to kids, pets, the aging population. Things that people are willing to spend money on, even in a recession. Essential type services like, you know, for instance, during COVID, you know, a lot of these businesses were still operating, whereas a lot of food guys were not. And then also, you know, what's Amazon resistant to kind of speak Seattle language there? Yeah, you know, what yeah. won't be disrupted? But what has the potential to disrupt? And so oftentimes what you see is white collar approaches within blue collar industries. You're bringing in the technology. I mean, we have a couple of clients, franchise or clients that have patented technology that they've infused, say, into the property services space. I was sharing an example of a couple of non-sexy franchises this morning with a client. And I've been joking that non-sexy is the new sexy. People love those understandable <laughs> businesses. I just yeah. had a client, you know, that bought a roll-off dumpster franchise back in the fall, and he's now expanding that. I'm just killing it. it Blown out his plans. In the past month or two, I've had, you know, we've been doing deals for like serve pro type businesses. I mean, those are never going out of style. Yeah. We had three clients. One had an insurance background. One had a corporate marketing background, and one was a former Wall Street attorney. All three of these in very different markets bought into a gutter business. The $600 billion industry you don't really think of top of mind, but amazing financials, you know, all an investment yeah. for them was between 150 and 200, including working capital. Mm -hmm. And these businesses are averaging 1.2 million in revenue with a 31% EBITDA margin or net profit into the day. So they're making 350 plus on the bottom line. Wow. And that's the average across all their owners in the country. Some are doing better than that. Oh. And so once people realize these types of opportunities that over 90% of my clients end up in a business with a company, oftentimes in an industry that was never on their radar, over 90%. Yeah. So I have yeah. so much fun kind of turning the light bulb on cool. for them to these types that. of businesses. And so you said, you know, 150 to $200 invest or $100,000 investment. And then that company is grossing over a million. And then the owner net is in the 300s range. Was that, did I hear you right on that? You heard me numbers? right. And they're building wow. this up where one day they'll be able, be able to have an exit on that business too. And as you know, as a business owner, you can write off expenses you can't as a W-2 employee. Yeah. So it's kind of the triple effect, the cash flow, wow. the business write-offs, and then the exit. I love that. That's amazing. And then how much do you encourage owners? I, I'm thinking again, you know, I know from, from gym models and restaurant models that there's this economy of scale that happens, you know, when you have one location, then you have another location, but then some of these service-based businesses are less, they're still location dependent, but especially if you're going out to customer clients' homes, like you're not, you know, you don't have a physical location that people are coming to. Is there a multiplication effect when you have more than one business? Or do you recommend like for home services, for example, if someone has a gutter business, maybe they should also have a, you know, something in law on care or like some, you know, the next lane over to kind of get that multiplication. I'm curious, how does someone scale or is it they just do one and done and they just keep going? What do you recommend? That is a great question. So I'd say our average deal size would be three locations, whether that be a physical retail facing, a customer facing location, or whether it be in a service-based business, like we were talking about where they define a territory as maybe 300,000 in population or a number of addressable businesses or households with these 
demographics. So oftentimes, either one of those people will buy three, they'll open up one and then start building towards those other ones. So it gives them that path to scale. I mean, sometimes I just had a client do a 10 unit oil change deal, you know, well, they're not opening up all 10 on day one, but you know, we do yeah, see some bigger deals. Big. And I do have some yeah. clients that go with just one out of the gate, yeah. but those are two strategies we talk about. One, five years from now, do you want to be super deep and really own the market in one business? that you know mm -hmm. inside and out? Or would you rather, you know, let's say even if you bought three territories, you know, like in the home services space, maybe you've got an insulation business. You're already in the customer's home. You're, you know, working with builders. What other services would be a natural extension? You know, pool cleaning businesses. You know, we've got a great fencing franchise. Well, that would be a natural extension. Yeah. You know, those two are a mosquito type business. So yeah. what I find is there's a strategy around complementing where maybe you can have some shared services, shared personnel, shared marketing, you know, lower that mm. customer acquisition cost on the front end. The other side would be diversify. You know, I have a client, he's 39 years old, largest franchisee of two men in a truck moving service and you know, operates in 10 markets, $30 million plus business. Well, he and I've done a couple of deals together the past few years where the businesses that he bought had nothing to do with that core business. Yeah. But what he did was he had an organization now of young folks that he was able to promote internally into these other opportunities and create these paths. Mm. And then yeah, yeah. in his case, he actually gives them some equity. They have skin in the game. They've proven themselves out. He set them up for success. And in every case, he's come back and bought additional locations after we've <laughs> done that deal. So yeah, and we just have case study after case study like that. That's really, really great. You know, personally, with the businesses that you're involved in, if this is you know not something you're not wanting to disclose, that's totally fine. How many businesses do you have some ownership stake in? So within the franchising realm, I've got six that I've got yeah. ownership in. I'd say two or three I'm a little more active in than the other ones. Others are truly yeah. passive. And then, you know, like you, I invest in real estate. I invest in both buying real estate as well as real estate lending, you know, and I find that those play together really well. Over half of my clients have real estate investments. And so whether it's from a portfolio diversification play or whether it's a complementary type business, you know, we see yeah. both of those. Yeah. And in those six businesses, are you the owner or are you an investor with other owners and maybe even outside of your personal experience? I'm just curious, like, what are all the different roles that, you know, at the seats at the table, I guess you could say, whether those are in deals that you're involved in personally, you know, as an owner or as an advisor or whatever. I'm just curious, what does it all look like? What does it typically look like? There are three that I was owner operator and with two others. And, you know, we had a GM that reported into us, but I was pretty active in those. I eventually sold yeah. my equity interest in those the majority of my equity interest to my partners. And so now I have a smaller piece, so I'm more yeah. passive there. The yeah. other ones I am more active in. I just got off a call. We do a weekly call. We do a monthly happy hour, you know, and then we do a little one-off, you know, ways to support. But that was one where I owned half the business and, you know, we brought in some other partners, bought out my existing partner. And then we just bought two other franchise locations ourselves within the same system. So franchising yeah. can lend cool. itself to a natural exit, whether you're looking to exit or whether you're looking to build and acquire others that already sure. have some brand awareness in that market. So sure. again, it just opens up the opportunities. Yeah, and we do yeah. see private equity and franchising in a massive way. I get calls every other day from private equity firms saying, hey, what are you seeing out there? What typically at the franchisor level, you know, they've been buying a lot of franchises at the franchisor level, investing money and growing those. But occasionally you'll see a roll up of you know, Orange Theory or you know, Surf yeah. Pro or like pods, you know, the movable storage. Mm -hmm. That's one where they came in and they bought up their franchisees, turned them into corporate locations, but provided a yeah. great exit for franchisees. Wow. Wow. That's super cool. For someone who's listening, who's you know super curious about this, like what is the paths, but they don't have the capital, right? So the, you know they don't have $100,000 plus in the bank. Like what are the paths toward ownership? And I know you mentioned the SBA and the, the SBA program has some really generous, you know, surprisingly generous numbers, at least when I first encountered them, but then also maybe from a skills standpoint of a skills acquisition, like how could someone be preparing right now? If they're like, I want to in five years own a franchise or you know be on the path you know well down the path towards owning franchises what are the some things that they could be doing right now to equip themselves both financially and you know skills wise yeah i'd say start tracking with the market i think you know really we've got a book coming out in q3 that's really going to be soup to nuts on all things franchising and you know if anyone wants to sign up for our newsletter on our website at free and bridge consulting we have some great content that comes out every month but we'll also get a copy to all of your listeners that sign up Love for it. our book they'll be coming out so and taking steps like that but you know I, i'd say roughly half of my clients use the SBA loan. And yeah. you, know, you still have to be able to 
put a down payment in of call it 20, 25%, 25, 30%. And I'd say if your net worth is below 125, 150 today, then work towards building up those savings. You know, it's probably not the best time to buy a business, but you really don't have to be much more than those numbers because what if you were to use an SBA loan, again, there are different ways, you know, with a 401k and IRA self-directing their portfolio loans, or sometimes we can find some lenders as well. They'll participate yeah. in other programs. But, you know, the great thing about our process is it is entirely free to our clients. We get paid by the franchisors on the back end. None of that gets passed on in any form to our clients. So it's a very clean model. We work with over 500 brands. And what I tell people is, you know, if you want to do more research, I mean, you can certainly go out there, Google around. But what you're going to find is every brand is putting their best foot forward. You're going to see all their marketing pitches. You know, we have the relationships (laughs) on the back end. We know what's going on. We know who has the momentum. We know who has the best leadership teams, what their backgrounds are. So we kind of get that behind the scenes look. That way we're able to really help guide our clients versus, you know, Again, they're paying, not paying any difference. Yeah, that's super cool. That's surprising to me. I, I know some people who in the private equity world are doing something somewhat similar to what you're doing, helping people find businesses to buy, but they're focused on local businesses and especially on online business. But they're typically, you're taking either some sort of retainer or even like a ownership, you know, some stake in the company. But what you're saying is, you know, the, working with you is funded by the franchises themselves. And so the franchisee has no risk, I guess, from working with you and your team. We, it allows us to be very consultative. We're never take a sales approach. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe just to play devil's advocate here. How do I know that I could trust that you're being incentivized equally to my best interests if I'm interested in working with you? Yeah, no, we're affiliated with the largest brokerage in the US. And so it gives us access to all the development groups, all the brands, and it's a very consistent kind of base on the back end. So that really never factors into our thinking at all. You know, it's rounding that never comes into play. So it's really a great model. And and we feel like having been a franchisor as well as a franchisee sets us up well to provide perspectives, you know, with our clients as we introduce opportunities to them. And then we take them through the discovery process and serve as a sounding board for them. And we have a lot of fun doing it. That's super cool. What are the common pitfalls for people who are going down this path that would result in them either choosing poorly, choosing, you know, not making the right choice for their skills, their interests, their, you know, their personality. And then also, you know, as far as operations, what are the pitfalls that they should watch out for? Yeah. You know, I'd say in the world of our clients, again, we've only had one over the years that hasn't worked out for, and there were some really good reasons as to why it didn't, that, that were unforeseen, but by and large, I mean, we've just have a lot of success with our clients. And so, but when I look at franchising in total, I'd say, you know, I think doing the due diligence ahead of time. I also think that partnerships, you know, partnerships are great till they're not, you know, I've yeah. not every partnership I've ever been a part of has been glorious, you know, and sometimes, you know, you just have to make sure that the contracts, the operating agreement with your partners is, is drawn up the right way. So I would say it can be more of a people issue on that front. Also, if you're terrible with people, you probably shouldn't be in business ownership. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I think your ability to work well with both clients and customers uh-huh. As well as your team, but also yeah. knowing your strengths. You know, do you yep. enjoy being at the front end, that sales and marketing type person, mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. wants to get a brand established? And if so, maybe your first hire is more on the operations side. Or, you know, yeah. if you're more back office and you've always been an accountant and you've never wanted to get out there, let's just say, and be on the sales side, maybe your first hire is a salesperson. So I think, you know, it takes yeah. some inventory of your strengths. Again, what we do is we try to match clients with opportunities that we see resonating to others with backgrounds similar to theirs have had success in, you know, and what do they want that day-to-day role to be in yeah. the business? That's great. Well, I think even in that, I hear some good takeaways for people who are thinking of going down this path of developing your people skills, developing your management skills and operations skills, and just increasing your self-awareness, which I know is, you know, can sound really soft and hard to kind of put a finger on, but I think there are ways to do that and to be putting yourself in a context where you're getting feedback on how you're impacting people around you. And yeah, I think therapy, you know, and group therapy in particular are ways that come to mind that are really, really helpful for getting that data, that feedback, which then can help you be a better leader, better organizer, better manager, all of those things. So that's, I think, some good some good takeaways as well. I'm curious, you know, when people hit play on this podcast, they're typically looking for more meaning purpose, you know, in their life, whether that be a total career change, or they just don't know exactly what it looks like, but they're just trying to figure it out for themselves. My first question related to that is, you know, how do you think about that in your work? How do you think about meaning purpose and whether that be, you know, you use words like calling or vocation, or I guess just the invitation to take this any direction that fits with you. But I'm just curious, you know, how you think about that? Yeah, no, I think first off, you know, I'd tell everyone, be encouraged. Know that you're not alone. I get the benefit of having these conversations cross country every day. There are so many common threads that I've seen. And I think COVID's caused a lot of people to really question the path they're on and do some introspective yeah. digging. And you know what I find is most good people have a desire to do something 
big. They want to not necessarily make a name for themselves, but they want to make sure that they're not leaving anything on the table. They want to fulfill their talents. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think recognizing that others are in the same boat on the same path, you know, some have gone there a little bit faster, figured things out. Others are still searching. And so I would just encourage them first off to continue down, continue asking questions, continue having conversations. But, you know, for me, what we do, you know, one of my mantras in life is, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I try to mm -hmm. steward resources, steward my time, steward, you know, whether it relates to my family or my clients or my community. But, you know, we really take an interest in our clients and their success is our success. I mean, there's nothing yeah. that I love more than getting referrals from past clients or or to see them opening up new locations. And you know, I track yeah. with them. I love those successes. I mean, it's very meaningful, you know, mm. the rewards that we get to see from the fruits of our labor. And then, you know, just life-changing situation after life-changing situation. In a lot of cases, and some, we're talking about another investment. You know, it's not always, yeah. you know, crazy, but it is incredibly rewarding, even if it is for someone rounding out their portfolio and allowing them to, you know, yeah. give themselves a little more time in five years when they can step back because the business is full-time humming and they can take a sabbatical or what have you. I love it. I love it. It's so great. I could see it being really, really fun to be a part of those transitions and giving that probably, yeah, people find the freedom and achieve the goals and build the thing that they're wanting to build. It's really And you're really creating neat. jobs. You're expanding your influence mm -hmm. as a business owner, getting involved in the community. Yeah. Like I mentioned, some of the nonprofit yeah. things that we're going to do around here. And then, you know, where do you want to be 10 years, 15 years down the road? Yeah. Do you want to be one that's mentoring other new entrepreneurs? Mm. And so yeah, everyone's wired a little bit different, but it is encouraging to see these common themes. And if you're an American, like I am, it is, I'm bullish on the U.S. You know, I see negative news headlines every single day, but these conversations on the ground that we're having in the spirit of entrepreneurism, it's alive and well, and we are seeing yeah. it firsthand. That's cool. I really feel like there is a movement happening toward business ownership. And maybe it's just the world that I, you know, the people that I'm listening to, the paying attention to as an entrepreneur, but I've just seen more and more people talking about, especially buying businesses, you know, whether they be franchise or otherwise. And I think that there's a big trend, a big change that's going to be happening in the next 10 years or starting now of, you know, people who are kind of aging out of their business and maybe they don't have family members or someone else to pass it off to. And so then they're going to be looking, you know, to exit and many of those being franchises. So I think it's a really, yeah, a really interesting space to pay attention to as you know, this transition is happening. Do you see that happening from your side? Absolutely. We have 10,000 people turning 65 every day. You know, a lot of them are exiting businesses. You know, it's interesting. I have a lot of clients that say, hey, I love this idea of acquisition through entrepreneurship through acquisition, yeah. you know, which has been popularized out there. Now, I think that that sounds great. But once you dig in, oftentimes, you know, you look under the hood and the owner's discretionary income line can be a little misleading. And so, you know, yes. oftentimes I find clients that they're looking at existing businesses and we definitely do some resales. That's probably 10% of what we do. But very oftentimes they circle back and say, hey, the grass wasn't necessarily greener. I really like the idea yeah. of you know starting fresh in a market with a brand that's proven out, that has the playbook where I can be in business for myself, but not by myself. I've got these great yeah. support systems from day one. But no, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I mean, we're seeing an all-time record level of interest in business ownership from where we mm -hmm. sit. You know, the data that we look at and the business starts and applications, you know, from the U.S. Census, you know, in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, absolutely point in that direction. And I think that people are realizing, hey, if I'm not building an empire for myself and my family, then I'm helping helping someone else build theirs. <laughs> you know, I'm working for yes. someone else to build theirs. Yes, and so yes. it's kind of like, why not now? And so I think there are yeah. a lot of positive tailwinds supporting this direction. I love it. I love it. Well, this has just been such a fun, fun conversation. I'm super interested. You know, as I said, I have a couple of bootstrap startups, best in some real estate, but you know, especially what you're saying about like, you know, you can do franchises as a more of a side hustle. I've never thought of like, that could be something that could be added into the portfolio to you know create additional income, to diversify. All of that sounds really, really fun and exciting and interesting to me. So I'm definitely going to dig in and yeah, and learn more. I know you mentioned that you have a book that you know, I'm, I'm excited to dig into, but for folks who want to follow along, learn more, what actually steps do you have for folks? Yeah, no, as I mentioned, come out to our website, frambridgeconsulting.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter. That'd be an easy first step. We have some great content coming out every month. We'll make sure that all of your listeners get a copy of our book as well when it's released in Q3, if you sign up on our website. And then secondly, you know, if, if this is an area that you're really interested in, let's hop on a quick 10 or 15 minute call and just have a brief chat and talk about what next steps might look like. And you know, certainly happy to share resources along the way as well and help you guide you in that thinking. But yeah, would love to engage and help out wherever we can. I love it. Fantastic. Well, don't be surprised if you hear from me personally in that regard, but hopefully some of our listeners too would jump in. And I'd also say, you know, the most popular social media platform that we're on is LinkedIn. You know, we stay pretty active out there, putting out content five or six days a week. So that'd be another good avenue to just kind of start dipping your toe in the water. 
Perfect. And I'll make sure to put your LinkedIn Just... and FriendBridge Consulting in the show notes so people can click on through. John, this has been so fun. Thank you so much just for you know indulging me and all my curiosity around franchises and for sharing so much of your story with us. I really appreciate having you on the show. Absolutely, Dan. Enjoyed it. Look forward to talking more. Thank you so much, John. That was so fun. I feel like I got a master's education in franchises. And thank you listeners for tuning in. If you'd like to connect with John, follow his work, go to our show notes at themeaningmovement.com slash John, that's J-O-N, and you can find the show notes there while you're on the site. And if you haven't done this already, I ask that you take a moment to do this. Go to themeaningmovement.com and opt into any of the subscribe boxes around the website so you can get the best of what we're producing for you. All of it's for free that we mail out when new episodes drop, when we're sharing new trainings, new worksheets, all kinds of great material that we're providing free of charge, all available for you at themeaningmovement.com. The podcast is just one piece of the many things that we're working on to help you level up your life, your career, your income, all of that. Go to themeaningmovement.com and opt in. If you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening to this. would love to have you following along. Our artwork is by Eliezer Ruiz. Our music is by Tom Roram. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with you shortly.